Got it. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is our first town hall meeting of 2023. We thought it was a good opportunity to bring a CEU to everybody that you can use uh, this year. It is an HSW CEU, and you'll get a little survey at the end of the session, and uh, we'll give you credit for attending. Uh, my name is Ted Moore. I'm the 2023 president of the college, and we have a very special presentation today on the VA task force, and we have special guests today. So without further ado, I'll get right to the special guest. He looks incredibly like his headshot. If you look on the screen, <laughs> the flags and everything. We have Dr. Michael Brennan, the Executive Director of Construction and Facilities Management, Office of Acquisition, Logistics, and Construction for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, we really appreciate uh, his attendance here today. Um, he is going to be on our Q&A panel at the end. And Mike, if you have some opening comments, uh, please uh, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, Ted. Um, one, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be able to join you here today. And, and I think for to kick it off here, really to share how perfect the timing is for this from a discussion a little over a year ago after uh, Ken Dickerman helped connect the dots with the with with you all. Um, what we have going on in the department is a really renewed um, approach to, to our strategy of what we need to do to overcome the challenges that we have in the department. And for those of you that I got to see at HFI or um, or perhaps SAME the couple of weeks before that, you know, uh, the the bottom line is we have old aging infrastructure and, and to bend the curve, we're gonna have to do a lot of things. We thought the air commission, um, I won't spend any time going over that, but it was a uh, act of Congress that basically said, review all your infrastructure and we're gonna move forward the plan to, to modernize and, and, and bring the VA's infrastructure up to modern standards in the right place at the right time where the veterans are. Well, Congress pulled the plug on that, but that doesn't mean our under our aging check underlying challenges disappear or that we don't need to keep moving forward. But what has resulted in that is a renewed emphasis at the department level, at the direction of the secretary to look at all of our processes in a new integrated strategic fashion moving forward. So since we had this discussion a year ago and, and uh, the team put together um, this report and then provided it was exactly the right time because we had something we called a facility sequester. It was all the most senior leaders in VHA and the headquarters of the VA to envision what the future of the department should look like, giving our mission sets, competing resources, and, uh, and, and all the host of things from all the different perspectives, driven from the, the boots on the ground at the field where our, our VAMCs and veterans are, up through VACO and CFM on how we can implement this. We were able to take this report um, inject it into that um, group of leadership meeting to consider all these things. And it's not just engineers and architects. We have brought together probably for the first time um, with this level of momentum, the department, the clinical leadership. So synchronizing clinical strategy that really should drive everything. And I think you all know that typically it's the forcing function of the capital investment project um, often has to be the compelling force to draw um, those decisions and strategies out of the the clinicians. Well, we actually have the clinicians at the bottom of the hill with us now, pushing the uh, snowball up the hill and it's getting bigger. And I don't think we're far from it getting over the top and rolling down um, and continuing to build momentum. So the timing was impeccable to have a, a, a group of thought leaders, uh, peers from industry, um, analyzing from the outset based on your expertise and experience um, in the private sector and, and working with the VA um, to um, really an unconstrained uh, project that, that imagined what the future should look like based on the veterans experience. And that was a really powerful thing to be able to hand off in real time to all the groups as preparatory materials coming into this meeting. It drove a lot of discussion. I don't want to get ahead of the brief, but almost every aspect of this became a, a talking point. Um, how do we integrate the lessons learned to a new paradigm of how 
um, health care is going to be provided given the challenges we have. Um, veterans in all areas, from urban areas to rural areas, you know, how do we reconfigure a, a large, huge bureaucracy organization that has planted acres, anchors um, after every major conflict at stations um, and corners of America where the centers of gravity of veterans of the old conflicts have migrated significantly. So all of this is food for thought and the same challenges that uh, the private sector are encountering, trying to overcome. We have those plus a whole lot more in the VA. And I think if I could just add one last thing in the opening comments, all of these things really reflect what the VA is thinking about in small pockets. There are a lot of clinicians that are thinking about how to do things um, more remotely, more temporarily, not building for 100 year solutions when that's really not our, our problem set. How do we get at leveraging technologies to enable diagnostics and, and, and uh, um, monitoring of patients in their own home? How do we adapt our infrastructure to provide a backbone that, that enables that while, while allowing clinicians and staff members to live in desirable low cost centers and service veterans nationally? How do we get at uh, rural solutions that are, that are mobile and temporal and all feed off a, a lean hub and spoke system? These are all things that have been happening in pockets of discussions in uh, the department that we've been pulling together and it dovetails perfectly with the, the presentation that the team put together here because it really brought together the clinical, I know this is all about imagining the infrastructure in the building, but it's all about the clinical lines of operation. We brought those together. This was a great tool to do it. And uh, I wanna commend the team on the work and I'm, I'm excited for everybody to be able to walk through the presentation here and have a robust Q and A that hopefully I can contribute to at the end. So thank you. Thank you. Um, very uh, strong endorsement. So we'll we'll uh, hopefully live up to that and uh, explain it. All right. Let me uh, let me uh, right now. This is not the full task force, but this is who is presenting uh, today. First of all, we have Sheila Kahneman. She is the uh, president of Jump Garden Consulting. She does uh, facility programming and design. She's also on the Board of Regents. She's in her fifth year. She runs the COC and our recruiting task force as well. So she's very active uh, in ACHA. We also have Bill Klein with Leo Daly. He is the Vice President and Project Director at Leo Daly. Um, he will be presenting today as well. Steve Langston, um, who is now Vice President of Design, um, at Rogers Lovelock and Fritz RLF here in Florida where I am. And uh, my name is Ted Moore. I mentioned before I'm with Haskell. I am the current president for ACHA on the board. And I was the VA task force facilitator for the group. There are others that were on the task force that are most likely in attendance. I know at least one of them is. And uh, they they certainly contributed to this as well. We just we just drew the short sticks to present. <laughs> Sheila. Uh, yeah. Well, so uh, today, as we mentioned, this session is going to summarize the findings of the VA task force, uh, and that included um, you know exploring new concepts and facilities to provide more equitable care to veterans, improving their health and well being. And as Ted mentioned before, if you fill out the survey at the end, you'll get one hour LU HSW. So our learning objectives um, included uh, learning about challenges facing the VA, uh, which is the largest integrated health delivery system in the US, uh, discovering a bit about healthcare technologies and how they can reduce the need for long travel and wait times and how they can service our veterans in rural areas and others in general. Uh, gaining an understanding of mobile healthcare solutions and how they can improve health and well being of veterans and others. And then finding out about a new facility type that uh, our task force worked on, designed to have a small footprint, low environmental impact rapid deployment and a relatively low cost. Okay, so um, let me start by saying why the task force, uh, the college 
uh, has a lot of standing committees. We also create task force uh, groups uh, that allow um, volunteers. Uh, we put a call out to certificate holders. You may see it every once in a while where we put a call out and we look for volunteers to come up in uh, on a task force like this one, uh, which, which we sent out in November of 2021 and started in January of 2022. It was supposed to wrap up in September last year, but we uh, actually didn't finish until December. So this was uh, quite a long-term effort. And, um, but it allowed us to become a collaborative think tank of volunteers and um, spend our own time thinking about this. So uh, it, we started with four questions. And these are the four questions. How do we improve access to care? How will it be delivered in the future? How do we make it more equitable? And what type of new facilities will be needed uh, to accommodate this new paradigm? And those were the drivers of the whole discussion. And when you and when you think about it, I mean, the Department of Veterans Affairs is the largest integrated hospital system in the U.S. You know, you read the the all the stats up here, but it's amazing me how big and how complex that is. So it made it a little more difficult uh, and we wanted to be more in depth of how we could answer these questions, understanding the population they serve. So uh, once we actually got rolling in January and February, the uh, Asset and Infrastructure Review Commission published their report about mid-March of 2022. And at first, when it came out, it's a very impressive website report. Um, when we read it, we said, wow, we're kind of on a parallel path. We're talking about the same types of things, closing older facilities, renovating facilities that are not quite as old, uh, and, and, and opening more outpatient facilities closer to where the veteran patients are. And um, we thought that doesn't really help anybody by, by kind of coming out with the same information. So we wanted to come up with uh, some ideas to, to uh, deal with what the Air Report identified as the challenges. And that was their plan is gonna cost a lot of money. I've heard billions, I've even heard the word beginning with a T, trillions for, for doing this. Um, it's gonna take a long time to do. Um, it mentioned that the median age of all their facilities, it's about 60 years. There's some that are older and there's some that are newer, obviously, but uh, quite a few are, are fairly old. And as, as Dr. Brennan mentioned, the shifting demographics, they're move, uh, some of the patients are moving away from where the facilities are and they don't really have facilities where they need to be. And this creates the, the last bullet, the excessive travel times to and from facilities. For some of these older, possibly disabled patients, making that trip is a real challenge. And they're doing that for every bit of their healthcare, just uh, you know, even small things. And it's quite a journey for them. So we wanted to kind of really focus on these issues. So uh, the task force goals uh wanted to include the qualities of veteran health care in the future that have been outlined by the VA. Um, yeah, obviously, we couldn't tackle everything, but we use these as kind of our guidelines of how we would maybe look at creating a new paradigm for how health care could be delivered, as opposed to the AIR report, which really was trying to improve upon the old paradigm. Uh, just uh, to mention a couple of these that I think we um, kind of pinpointed were flexibility. We wanted to make sure that anything that we did was very flexible. We know healthcare is changing all the time. So, you know, how, how will these developments in communication, technology, patient family experience, things like that, how can we design something very flexible, both at the system approach and also um, uh, as a facility or, a, or program? Uh, the other thing we were very interested in is, is connectivity, how we could increase communication and care coordination uh, across platforms, and that efficiency, um, you know, that we would try to exhaust, as it says here, non-capital solutions first, um, or the idea being that 
trying to reduce waste, reduce the built environment, but bringing more access to the veteran. And if we go to the next slide, um, I'll tell you why. Um, as, as Ted was mentioning, it's a significant challenge. You know, a, a substantial number of veterans live beyond a reasonable drive time. Uh, you know, there, I mean, it's a broad statistic, but between 40 and 85% of enrollees drive 60 minutes each way for care. I remember back when I was working um, at Jesse Brown in Chicago, there'd be vans bringing in veterans from Indiana driving two hours to come in and see specialists. So it's not necessarily always um, where, you know, a, a strictly rural area, but also having uh, care delivered even in urban spaces. Um, a significant number of enrollees live relatively close to a VA site, but lack transportation for financial reasons or limited by disability. So even if they live around the block, if they can't get out of their house to come to see the doctor, uh, that could be problematic. And you know, overall, one third of the 9 million veterans enrolled in the VA healthcare system live in rural areas. So how do we reach those people effectively uh, with a flexible model? So the first thing that we thought about was technology, since we're, we're trying to, to reduce the, the, the footprint of the built environment. Um, there's so many different um, opportunities with technology. There's been so much development over the last uh, decade or so. Um, we just felt that it was our duty to, to do a little bit of, of looking into this. And we're thinking about things that exist now and assembling them and, and, and reassembling the system of care to create an, an even better care system um, and changing the flow so that somehow we can utilize uh, what the VA has even better. And we're gonna show you how that's gonna work, but first let's look at some of the pieces and how they fit together. Um, the, the first piece is, is really the technology that sits in the background. Um, and this, the first one of course is predictive care. And as, as I think everybody who's spoken so far mentioned, um, the VA is the largest healthcare system nationally. So they have a unique opportunity uh, with this huge, uh, with these huge data sets, to um, to think carefully about how they do predictive care. And it, I think what's important is to think about predictive care not not as predictive care, but as predictive care as the beginning of a process where you have predictive care, you have screening, you have an evaluation, you have early treatment, and that leads to better outcomes. Right, so better outcomes for the veteran is what we're all about. The second one is this active monitoring. Again, this is in the background. Um, can we find ways to use the technology to intervene before people get sick or even before they have an acute episode of a chronic condition? Um, and again, this is, this is technology that exists now. We're thinking about smartphones. We're thinking about wearable devices. We're thinking about swallowable de devices. Um, you know, the Internet of Things is bringing new technologies and new practices every day um, to the arsenal that that physicians and physicians assistants can and and care coordinators can use um, to utilize this technology again in the background um, to identify people who may need care and to get to them um, before that requirement becomes um, acute. So I think that the next couple of things that we were thinking about really revolve around communication. Um, and, and I just love these two quotes. So I, I'm going to read them like, you know, imagine good morning. You know, we see, we see you didn't take your meds today. Um, well, you know, that may scare some of you a little bit. It is a little bit Orwellian. Um, but, but if you think about it, um, if you have a loved one who's a vet, wouldn't you want to know that there's a system in place to help that person if you couldn't be there in person? And gosh, I would, you know, my answer would be yes. You know, I'd love to have that person get a phone call and say, hey, you know, maybe you should take your meds this morning. Um, so we, we, we really do think that this kind of communication can help everything from, from medication to getting appointments to help with, with prosthetics. Um, and, and research has shown that, that this kind of communication and sort of patient navigation overall is one of the most effective ways to reduce cost, to improve outcomes, and to increase patient satisfaction. So another way 
you know, to enhance communication is to think about um, veterans. And we all live in a world now where different generations are communicating in dramatically different ways. And veterans, um, of course, are a slice of the population. So this is a challenge that everyone faces and the VA is no exception. So what we're suggesting is that the VA continue to enhance and diversify its effort to offer multiple channels to get to allow people to get to these resources in ways that, that they feel comfortable with. And that may be telephone, it may be email, it may be text, it may be a chat bot, it may be social media, it may be video chat, it may be the metaverse anytime uh, soon. Um, so this is ways for, for that we're suggesting vets to reach out to the VA, as well as um, the VA reaching back out with push notifications um, and, you, and sort of helping people understand what the resources are and, and how, and, and making them available through multiple channels. So finally, there's the, the notion of treatment. You know, it's, it's all about treating the vet, isn't it? So um, the VA already has a pretty robust mobile medical vehicle um, system. Um, but again, you know, I love this quote, stay there, Mr. Jones, we have a vehicle in the area and we're gonna come help you. Uh, that to me just says it all. Um, you know, we, so we suggest that the VA continue to enhance and diversify its effort to bring these services to vets in remote areas and do it in, in creative ways. And we're going to suggest in a moment a, a, new, v, a new building type to support this effort to, to enable the VA to, to do that in a wider range of locations and to do it more effectively with um, a wider, um, hopefully a wider uh, diversity of services. And then finally, home care. You know, how would you like to receive your care person or remote? The pandemic really demonstrated to everybody that these remote doctor's visits are effective and efficient and people like them. So how do we re leverage what we've learned? And how, how do we couple that with all of these other ideas to create a system of care that's effective and responsive and create, gr creates great outcomes for uh, and a better quality of life for, for people who've given so much for this country? So, you know, the idea we had is that from William Gibson that he has a great quote that says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, just like the healthcare in VA is not necessarily evenly distributed for a variety of different reasons. And so a change is needed. Um, this is a chart right off the VA's uh, own website that talks about what are some of these issues and getting access and equity of care to our veterans. This is, and, and the picture to the right is uh, a gentleman named Mark that Ted uh, actually came upon in Jacksonville, got his permission to, to get his picture uh, and everything. Uh, but uh, it, it really just brought home to our group how important this um, issue is. And there's a lot of different reasons why um, veterans are having issues as we've talked about. Some is that, you know, they just feel that it's inconvenient for them. They may not be able to get an appointment. And uh, we feel that technology, which we all experienced during the pandemic, could help bridge this gap and bring, instead of the veteran necessarily having to go to get health care, that health care can come to them and help can come to them in an easier way. And so, in looking at the existing flow of the VA health system, which this is a very simple um, diagram of a 1600 facility um, organization, plus, 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 uh, they're basically, if you simplify it down, it's a hub and spoke model where they have a series of clinics that uh, a veteran can go to. And then if you need to uh, go to uh, a more you have a more acute need, you can go to a tertiary hospital. And so if you're within that ring and you're close to it, as Sheila was talking about, uh, and you don't have mobility issues, uh, you can get your care uh, fairly easily. But a third of those veterans, as we were saying, are rural, and they have difficulty uh, getting to that. And so what we were proposing and going to uh, use, enhancing their system with technology is actually reversing the flow of the hub and spoke model and taking the healthcare from these large um, tertiary hospitals and clinics out to where the veterans are. 
and then through wearables and low-level uh, artificial intelligence, you can actually track uh, a patient's progress and uh, bring them the care that they need. And so with that, we, we, you, we are introducing the RD Hub flow. So Ted, would you like to talk to us a little bit about that? I will. So we came up with a cool acronym. Uh, being the Department of Veterans Affairs, we know like all the military branches like to have a neat acronym, but um, it worked out really well. We call it the Rapid Deployment Health Utility Base or RD Hub. And it is a, a different way of thinking. Again, it's, it's a facility that supports going out to the patient and we don't bring pa patients to this facility. They don't drive to us. Uh, it's completely a utility base. So here's what we envisioned for um, a rural setting. Uh, we took, uh, we wanted it to be a low footprint type of design. Um, we wanted it to be sustainable. I don't know if you noticed all of us were uh, lead people. So we're, we're, we're very uh, aware that we, we want to have a low footprint. Plus, when you come into some of these rural areas and um, you plug into their grid, their water, their sewer, their power, um, you know, we, we don't want to have a, a, an impact. Um, and this, this rapid deployable part of this health utility base is that it's modular. So what you're going to see here is a modular building. And this particular example, this is eight acres. It's a 36,000 square foot building. It's made up of about 32 modules. That, that could stack higher. That could be longer. We could have more than eight acres. But this kind of gives you the idea. We want to strategically locate this where it would serve us, uh, serve as many patients as it possibly could. But it also needs to be where we can get the utilities we need to the site, as well as have access to uh, delivery routes and getting supplies into the facility. Uh, the facility uh, could be temporary. Um, it, because it's modular and has a low impact to the actual site infrastructure, it's something that we feel could possibly build, be built in a, in a range of like six to eight months. Um, right now, I know that some EDs that are being built in my state of Florida are being built with modules in about three to four months. Um, they've almost got it down to three months now. And a lot of that time is just preparing the site uh, while you wait for the modules. So, you know, the other part of this is it could be disassembled and moved. Um, or it could possibly become another community asset. But as you can see in this, you know, this overall look diagram, it's, it's a very simple idea. Uh, we, we supply the building through the delivery dock and the flow around the perimeter of the site. Um, it's backed up by emergency power. You see that we've got a lot of uh, wind generators. Uh, we could do geothermal exchange. We could do fuel cells. Uh, if, if there are some gas services available, we could potentially use them. But the idea was to uh, you know, use as much solar, wind, and other clean energy uh, sources as we could. You'll also see that we, we, uh, we have some other features, which are shown in some other images I have here. So, uh, you know, for our stormwater, we would manage it. Not all states require that you manage your own stormwater, but we would manage it, and we would treat it and use it for site irrigation. Uh, we are showing some greenhouses as an idea, potentially, you know, how, how great would it be if you, if you brought some fresh vegetables with you when, you when you reached out to some of the vets or maybe even flowers or something like that? You know, there's, that's an idea. Um, but the site is, uh, you know, here, here's the, the building that we were showing, the 36,000, 32 modules. A couple of uh, examples in the inset. Uh, we've seen modules stack eight, nine stories high. Um, you can see some stuff online where in other countries they've taken them even higher. Um, the modules are extremely strong. They, uh, it, it's interesting what, what I have done personally when dealing with the structural side of it is uh, when you have high seismic or high wind loads, that's a challenge. But being able to transport and lift the modules is even more structurally challenging 
So these things actually become very, very strong units and make the building quite strong and resilient. So drones, drones, um, if you go out on the internet, you can find drones being used around the world for deliveries. The one I really like is there's a drone service in South Africa. There's, uh, there's, they use a catapult system and a more airplane looking drone and it's delivering uh, meds and supplies and all throughout South Africa uh, uh, through a service uh, to rural areas. We feel that uh, drone technology, you you know, right now you can get stuff delivered right to your backyard uh, in some parts of the country. We're going to see this grow. Uh, this certainly allows us to respond uh, and deliver things uh, when we need to, as opposed to waiting to uh, deliver it the next day. So the heart of the campus is the vehicle loading and service center. So as you saw, we have a, a large area where we have covered parking for all the different types of mobile services vans. You got different sizes, different capabilities in each of those vans. Um, they can pull into these bays, be loaded with supplies, uh, be repaired, uh, or whatever needs to be done. They, um, you know, obviously we would have to uh, have some of these would be diesel powered, some of them could be hybrid, some of them could be full electric vehicles. The idea is that we're collecting as much PV uh, solar energy as we can and using it to charge these vehicles and use it for power source for the building. So there's another view of the on-site power generation. And, you know, the fourth uh, mission of the VA is to provide uh, support during disasters. And so we think these could also become resiliency centers. They're already being supplied with uh, medical supplies and they could be also stocked with emergency food and water. And by having a heliport in the drones and being strategic on where we put our sites so they don't become susceptible to flooding or, or other issues, uh, we, we could become a resiliency center that could reach out to veterans in need at, if there was a disaster for instance, a tornado or uh, a fire or some other event. So the bottom line is with this new type of facility, it's a facility that allows us to implement the technology um, to provide a rapid delivery of healthcare to the patient. Um, that second floor in this particular model, that could be a telehealth center connected to satellites for uh, telehealth in other areas. It could also be an area where we have staff. If it's a really rural area. And there's not a lot of staff. You can rotate staff through this facility. Uh, they do a one month stint here. Um, that type of uh, uh, thinking, you know, where we we would provide, you know, sleeping quarters and support for that type of staff that would that would, you know, go out to these communities and to these rural areas and provide their services. Um, so by doing this, we won't eliminate all trips to the clinics or to the hospital, but we will greatly reduce the number of trips to these facilities for a large number of the rural and limited ability patients. And that's the idea behind it. Um, it's also very cost effective and quick to deliver. And I think those two statements are really powerful given the budget challenges and the time challenges, um, I, I, I hear, um, I don't know this to be true, but a lot of times getting a VA project built takes a lot of time. And here we would need some type of uh, prototype facility that's approved and that can flex and we would be able to build those modules. The other thing is you could build those modules in certain parts of the country where you have access to labor and take them to areas where there, there is limited or no uh, skilled labor to build any type of facility. So it gives you flexibility when you have these, uh, these modular designs. Yeah, I wanted to emphasize also uh, that this building, patients don't come to this building at all. Um, all the services will be pushed out to the patient. So it's, it's almost like a, transportation staffing hub 
uh, as opposed to the idea of pulling people to a facility, we're pushing the services out. So the conclusion for all this for us, and um, you know, we welcome everyone to look at the report. Obviously there's a ton more detail in it um, on a lot of other aspects uh, that are worth looking at. But just as a high level, uh, there's the whole idea is less reliance on the built environment as much as possible, but that is your, your, your last resort is actually to have to come to a clinic or in the end, come to a hospital. That the idea is that the services are pushed out and they're pushed out through all the wonderful new technology, AI, everything that's out there right now that's just gonna keep growing and growing. Uh, you know, it's a transition to technology and mobile-based strategies in general. You know, it's a hard thing for us as architects to get our head around, but that's where it's at. <laughs> no, we don't want to be building buildings. And you can tell from our design, we're not looking to build a Taj Mahal. We want something that's very practical, very simple and easy to build. It doesn't, you know, it could look nice, but that's not the point. Um, that the whole idea is personalized in-home healthcare augmented with technology. So as much as possible, we're meeting the veteran in the home. And then the whole idea of supporting the veteran whole health at a community level. Uh, we didn't talk about it much, but you know, we were looking at all different aspects now of, of bringing services into small towns, um, having clinics at dollar stores, you know, uh, on different days of the week. Um, you know, fresh food markets, you know, all the things that we've, uh, that in general, everyone's been looking at, but you know, how could that support the veteran? Because what we want is a system built around the needs of those who've served, not, not um, what we've been traditionally doing. Uh, so uh, as we go to the next slide, I wanted to welcome anybody to, um, if you have any questions to put them in the chat right now, um, in general, uh, as uh, Ted mentioned before, we had a, a terrific group of people that came together um, along with the four of us, uh, Wayne Barger, who is on the call right now, I saw him, I think he's still there, <laughs> I'm not sure, and uh, Ann Cox and, and Jim Hageman. Uh, the nice thing about our committee and the way it was structured is that we had representation from all different size um, uh, firms that did work with the VA and had a lot of VA experience from the very large firms to those of us who have women-owned businesses and um, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses also. So we were able to get a, a very broad range of experience uh, with the VA. And now we can open it for questions. Um, Ted, are you going to see I'm the going to stop chat? sharing so we yeah. can see faces. Can you see the chat? Yes. Uh, the chat, yes. Um, have you done a staffing study and parallel with this proposal to determine staff to patient ratios, availability of providers, et cetera? <laughs> well, we didn't get that far. <laughs> right, right. So, no, that's a great point. Um, you know, are we creating more FTEs in this model? Um, we're hoping that the predictive AI, the technology, um, will balance that out. So, um, it 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 obviously is a great question and a great point. And it well, needs telehealth to be extending physician services. For certain. Yes. So that's that's obviously a question beyond the task force effort. Uh, what we're what we're presenting here is a concept and um, some ideas on how to um, when you don't have enough money and enough time um, solve some of the issues that were identified in the report. That is the only question that I have up here at the moment. Emily, did any more come in or? Oh, here's one. Okay, here we go. Oh, here we go. Some more. <laughs> Some more coming in. Um, would the RD Hub be PSRDM compliant? Okay. I get, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> That's physical, physical security resiliency. That's absolutely what you showed, Ted. Yeah. Uh, it'd be life safety. 
obviously a, a lower. Uh, we we did put a perimeter on. fence, and uh, we could probably design it for uh, progressive collapse, and we could probably keep the landscaping around the perimeter of the building, Don. Although my images probably showed some landscaping, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that would be criteria driven by the you know the VA. Well, and I I think there would be. Um, am I off mute? Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes, can. Sir. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a great question in context of how we can shave costs and time off. Look, if, if the hub concept is not servicing any patients, let alone inpatients, I think there may be other mitigation factors that could reduce some of that threat level, or there could be a, a, a perhaps a, a waiver situation for this typical facility type because of the, the mission that it's meeting. You know, there, there are waiverable abilities that are out there for these requirements. Um, some places it's hard to get those waivers for a lot of good reasons. But I think I think this is what's, I think, great about this imagining um, and the concept and how this could be implemented. And perhaps that's just one more reason why this is better because we're not pulling the patients to the site. We may open ourselves up to even more efficiency and savings because we can reduce our, our built requirements for the, you know, I've, Sheila, I, I like the comment of, you know, how can we do everything before we have to build anything? Well, then one, to take that one step further, when we do build something, how can we keep it at the minimum, you know, code levels uh, for compliance and not have to layer on all these additional things that, that make sense in the context of a, you know, a long-term high risk, you know, um, type facility based on all sorts of things. And they're smaller, right? I think if we get to a scale and keep these small, then you're mitigating your risk just by distribution. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not subject to a catastrophic event in one location like you might be able to. I think it's a great question. I also think it draws out a maybe an argument of why this kind of strategy might be a, a good one to explore. Thank you. A um, couple of things after that one. Um, thank you, Patrick. Uh, he says, thank you for the presentation. This is great that we can improve veteran care, send it to the patient and it's scalable. Um, we have another one here. One of the difficulties in building for the VA is the security requirements. I think we just addressed that um, unless anybody thinks we, we need to keep on that one. Um, can this adopt to brownfield sites? Um, I, I think it could to a point. It depends on what the issues are on the brownfield site, it, but it, it could to a point. Can I tell if I could? Um... I, I think this concept, I think there's another possible outlet to implement this besides modular is perhaps it's a adaptive reuse of um, industrial facilities or or, mm -hmm. or dark uh, big box stores, you know, in many rural areas, that's that's not uncommon that what may have been a viable uh, um, Walmart or something in the past or logistics operation that may already lend itself to this could be maybe adapted um, with these same concepts as, you know, a different way of implementing it. Um, and I think that's that's something I've taken notes on to explore um, in this concept as well as maybe to pilot some of this. Initially, th there may be, um, not using the brownfield site term, but um, adaptive reuse of, of underutilized or, or dark, uh, otherwise serviceable facilities out there in the rural areas. And, and we talked about that actually, and you have to be strategic on what you select. So you don't want to get into a, a, a two year rehab of a facility. Yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of investment. Um, okay. Um, I mentioned sites in Africa being supplied with drone deliveries. I've missed it, but do you know if there are other healthcare facilities in the US capitalizing on this technology? I don't know of any specifically right now, but I, I, I wouldn't doubt you'd see it on the news in the next year. So, so it's so it's interesting. So in the VA, we do have a couple of innovative sites that are um, taking um, production of 3D printing off the campuses and are looking at using drone to serve, to uh, shuttle the, the the work back and forth. But also in the federal space, recently I I was asked to assist uh, one of the secretary senior advisors in sitting on a new. Uh, interagency work group is driven by the Department of Transportation, looking at what the future requirements may be for vertical takeoff, um, both FFA requirements, also, also infrastructure requirements that would 
facilitate this. Um, so we are we are actively looking in the department right now um, where this kind of technology could lead in the future. I think we're a little ways off, but maybe not as far as as as, as I even think now, given the rapid advances in, in that technology. Great, thank you. Um, how soon can this be approved and funded? Will there be flexibility in building design? <laughs> Rod, and, and you missed a question before from Neil, which is sort of on the same elk. Are there expected plan next steps in advancing this idea to the VA for some type of implementation? Right, I'm sorry well, about that, Neil. Well, let me jump in there without committing the federal government to, to any, <laughs> anything here. This, so this, is, this has been integrated with this work, strategic work we're going on right now. Um, and we're looking at prototyping some things in a different context. So it's not far-fetched that, that this concept could be adopted and put into a prototype, prototyping type stream. But I think the next step of Ted, and we haven't talked about this at all, but I, there may be an opportunity to, to distill this presentation from you all um, and not just allow me to, to participate with amongst the college, but to present this to the secretary and his senior leaders. Um, there's a weekly um, event that goes on that's just for this kind of stuff. I would, I would want to tee this up through the Veterans Health Administration prior to doing that. But we may be able to, if you're amenable um, to the discuss, discussing the art of the possible, getting on calendars in the future for maybe two more um, presentations, very similar to what you did today, but, but focused on the senior leaders, um, just to provoke the thought. So I have shared this with the folks in the infrastructure sequester community, but there's a broader strategic leadership body, including the secretary of the department, it's an opportunity that we could could present this this very brief um, in some format, maybe a little trimmed down for time, um, and that that could instigate some future steps. So I'm willing to have that discussion, Ted, with you and others um, um, after we wrap all this up. Absolutely, and we 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 have thought that 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 was a possibility, and it could happen. We'd be glad to do it. We and we'll refine whatever we need to do. Okay. Um, absolutely. So thank you again. Um, so Patrick uh, had mentioned how soon can it be? <laughs> I mentioned that one. Um, this is a, uh, someone put in a link in here, Wayne did, uh, for a zip line for drone deliveries. I guess zip line is the company name, Wayne. Is that correct? Okay. So it, it's happening. So we, we, we think it's absolutely uh, a viable delivery method. Um, you know, remember a few years ago, we were all going to have automatically driving vehicles going everywhere, but that kind of faded. And, but that, that's an idea too. We could have delivery vehicles um, uh, moving supplies too. Um, I might've missed it, but did you study the radius in which a hub would serve to determine how many might be needed? Um, early on, we did look at some, some regions in the country. We, we looked at some, I believe, in um, rural Arkansas, Oklahoma range. And um, we did look at, you know, where the facilities were and where the patients were. These maps are actually available from the VA. And we looked at those and we said, you know, if they had an RD hub right here, look at all the people they could serve. And so there, we believe there are viable opportunities, particularly in the rural areas, uh, where this would work well. Um, we've also kind of, we didn't visualize it, but we talked about it. This would also work in urban environments that ironically have similar situations. So um, let's see. And then the survey, the link to the survey, which I believe will also be emailed out, correct, Emily? Correct. Yeah, so the survey just asks you for your name and rank and serial number and, and uh, to get your CEU, just to make sure you uh, attended. Um, I believe that is all the questions and we are, we got a couple of minutes left. Anybody have any additional questions, want to raise your hand? John, are you raising your hand? John Rogers? I thought I, thought I saw it, no. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I did, I did want to mention, I'll put in a plug for all of us at ACHA that, you know, we're going to continue to have these types of task forces uh, going on um, through the organization. And 
I know I can speak personally that, you know, we, we did this for a whole year. We met every month, but it was just such an invigorating conversation to be able to talk about things like innovation and futures and things like that. So I would really encourage any of you um, as we come up with new task forces to join those task forces and get involved. I mean, it's a great way to meeting people all over the country and, and very high level thinking, which we don't always get to do at our day to day jobs. So, um, you know, if you can do it, I, I would, I would suggest it. Absolutely. Um, I do have a like a 25 second animation clip that we could play on the way out or if anybody else has any more questions. Um, I see a lot of thank yous. Um, and, and I see one more from from Patrick here. Uh, will the building design have flexibility? Absolutely. That's the that's one of the key things that you'll find with the, the modular building. It, it could be half the size we've shown. It could be stacked higher. It could be L-shaped. I the, the example we showed is just a very simple idea. Um, it it really needs to be tailored for the particular market. And um, I think building these modules um, in strategic areas of the country would allow you to uh, to flex as needed. Thank you, Ted. Hey, hey, Ted and team, I think what's great about this is you were imagining this based on the questions, but there are so many applications. I get a little excited about the uh, the modular construction um, because, look, we it's not just the rural areas. We could benefit from um, you know pre-engineered or pre-modular or off-site construction. The speed of delivery to get the right place in the right time for the veterans. In my prior life in the army, I I had an assignment in Kosovo to build a hospital there, and. This was in 1999, and we we worked with Cadalto. If anybody's familiar with Cadalto in in Europe, and they delivered on a convoy of uh, semi trailers a full inpatient hospital with ORs, all the services, um, ICU hookups, dropped it on site in 1999, and that hospital is still functioning and probably one of the better facilities in the region. That was a modest investment then, huge return on the investment. You know, there's a thought that these things are, are, are temporal or, or just temporary solutions, but I think we can change that paradigm um, and implement these. And they don't have to look like, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, by trash. You know, some of these facilities that, that Europe, I think, is way ahead of us on here, you, you would not know that they were uh, these modules, just like you showed in the diagram and multi story. And in fact, actually pretty good architecture on some of these uh, designs. So I think there's a lot of room that we could adopt this practice. And I think your presentation here gives a way to showcase it in one avenue of utilization. But I think I could also use that as a, a uh, inflection point of discussion to say, but, but hey, we need 300 C box right now in the department. That's a true answer. We need 300 right now today. This could be a solution towards rapidly placing a, not, uh, a large number, if not all of them, while allowing us to focus uh, more resources and design on our, our larger tertiary facilities. So I really appreciate the efforts of the team here. Uh, this, this is really good for a whole lot of reasons. So I just thank you all for, for really putting in the effort for, for the VA on this. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brenner. That was fantastic. And I can't thank you enough for being here. And uh, with that, um, thank you everybody for attending. Um, we are just about at time and uh, we look forward to having you in our next town hall and we are going to try to make them all CEU based town halls if we can. So thank you everybody. I will play the animation.